Nate Silver's website, 538, uh, is actually generally pretty good in my opinion. So they, they use stats and facts and they try to make predictions for sports and politics. Now, usually they're pretty spot on. Um, but the problem is, in my opinion, when their so-called experts start giving opinions, then they look really stupid. When they just stick to the data, they do a decent job. So, you know, for example, they got, uh, I'm not sure, I think McCain versus Obama, they got every state right. Nate predicted every state right in that election. It, for Romney versus Obama, he picked like 48 out of 50 states right or something like that. Now, all of the data people blew it in the, the 2016 election. But, to be fair to Nate Silver... He was the least wrong <laughs> of all of the of all of the you know stat people. So that like the Huffington Post had like a ninety seven or ninety eight percent chance that Hillary Clinton was going to win. If I'm not mistaken, with Nate Silver, it was about seventy eight percent on the day of the election that Hillary was going to win. Now that's still overwhelming for Hillary, but he was the one who was being most realistic about like, eh, hold on here, see. After the fact, what became pretty obvious is, even though it's true that Hillary had like a 3 to 5% lead in terms of, you know, the, the popular vote, the way that that support is broken up around the country, Trump can pick off those key states. And that's exactly what happened. Trump picked off the key states in the Rust Belt, where he was campaigning like a madman leading into the election, where Hillary Clinton didn't even step foot in many of those states. So... What's interesting is she did win by millions of votes in terms of the popular vote, but he picked off the right states. So even though the polls were not that off, the predictions were off. Because the polls said 3 to 5% win, she pretty much fell in that range. Um, but the way the, the support was structured throughout the country, it, the Electoral College went to Donald Trump. So Nate was the least wrong. Um, and unfortunately... You know, the stuff that I was saying right when we learned it was going to be Hillary versus Trump turned out to be totally correct. Um, well, now they're going to dip their toe into the 2020 conversation. And yeah, this is beyond terrible. I honestly believe that as time has gone by, they have gotten worse. Like one, one of the things that they were terrible on in the 2016 race was unbelievably dismissive of Bernie Sanders, even though... He overperformed across the board. I mean, this is a guy who, what did he finish with? Like 45% of the vote when he started the race at like 3%. He won like 22 states. Kept overperform, 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 overperform. Closing the gap with Hillary. Cl Hillary's hanging on for near fucking life. And the entire time, Nate Silver and all those people are like, Bernie, oh, that's so funny, Bernie. Oh, he sucks. Um, well, now they're right back to their old bag of tricks. Here come the data people giving nothing but opinions pulled right out of their anuses. Essentially, we are going to go around and pick who we think has the strongest chance of becoming the Democratic nominee in the 2020 presidential election. And in order to figure out who is going to go first, I have this handy Make America Great Again hat. Micah, can you help me out? Pick the first name. Who's going to go first? All right, Sarah. All right. Well, I've got the easy choice today. So I am definitely going with Senator Kamala Harris. She would have a lot of young energy for the party, an inspirational pick. And also, she doesn't really have that long of a record. So if you're trying to dig up dirt, there's not much on her, I would argue. That's a hard pick to argue with. That last point, though, I think is a is a really good one. Right. I mean, Obama was young, and that was one of the, there just wasn't anything to stick him on. All right. Okay. Megan, we got a whole table of faces here for you. Yes, I love it. So, I'm actually going to pick Joe Biden, which is sort of the a little bit of a counter to the the argument that Sarah's making. That I my argument behind Joe Biden is is that all of the indicators at this point that we're looking Both. at. Um, are, uh, are pointing to Biden. I think also um, the Obama brand remains strong and Joe Biden is associated with him. All right. Uh, hard pick. So many beautiful faces on this table. 
But uh, this is just too easy. Sure. We're going to have to go with Beto. This is not an argument based on policy. This is not even necessarily an argument based on which part of the party he can energize the most. It's his je ne sais quoi. <laughs> So I'm gonna have to say for now, I'm going with the guy who has the spark. That is hard to argue with and, and matches with Sarah's point about not having a long record. My right. pick, the last pick. Yes. It's very tempting to pick one of these white guys who I don't know who they are. Um, but instead, I'm gonna pick Ooh. Amy Klobuchar from the great state of Minnesota. This video is almost beyond parody. Now, again, I want to be clear here. This isn't a bunch of random idiots sitting around a table talking about politics. These are the employees of the so-called data journalism outlets. And everything they said there was not based on any data. Now, I'm going to be fair to one of them, perhaps too fair and too kind to one of them. Um, and that'll be the Biden pick. But let me, let's walk through this. So first of all, let's go to the beginning. Kamala Harris. Now, why did uh, the first one pick Kamala Harris? Well, you know, it's, it's, uh, I like, she's got a lot of energy. Uh, what does that even mean? <laughs> she's got a lot of energy. Um, and she, uh, she's an inspirational candidate. What does that mean? Again, they're just saying stuff. You're just making noises with your mouth. She's got a lot of energy. She's inspirational. Isn't inspirational in the eye of the beholder? I mean, that is totally subjective. The data people are supposed to be objective. Not subjective. I mean, come on. She's inspirational and she has energy. Uh, and then they go on to say, well, there's not a lot of stuff in her record, so that's going to help her. First of all, hilarious that that's the way they look at it. Like, oh, they didn't do much, so uh, that's good. What? Again, totally subjective, but there actually is a decent amount of stuff in her record, man. I mean, come on. If you follow this stuff closely, you should know. So these people all should know. There was a giant scandal with Kamala Harris because when she was the Attorney General of California, she refused to prosecute Steve Mnuchin of Goldman Sachs and One West Bank because Steve Mnuchin was illegally foreclosing on grandmas and grandpas during the subprime mortgage crisis in the Great Recession. Kamala Harris's own department said you should prosecute him. You know what she did? Nothing. She didn't prosecute him. Why? Campaign contributions. So when people say, I'm not sure about Kamala Harris, that's why! It's stuff like that! But they make... By the way... Didn't mention a single poll. Why? Because she's not leading in a single poll. She's not. She's not leading in a single poll. She's down at 4%. I mean, come on, man. But she, her energy is good, and she's inspirational. By the way, you know what inspirational might be code word for? Inspirational is like, oh, uh, black woman. So she's inspirational. So in other words, let's uh, focus, overly focus on identity and use that as a proxy for actual policy arguments and a reason why somebody should be elected. And this is why CNN, in all the, the lists they've done recently, ranking, the power rankings for the 2020 nomination, Kamala Harris is number one in all the lists. Based on what? Based on what? Well, you know, hey, uh, she, uh, she's black and she's a woman and uh, she does the bidding of the establishment, so we're going to cynically weaponize identity politics and try to make it so that she gets elected. Oh, well, that would be the actual truth, but they don't say that. Oh, she's uh, inspiring and stuff? Oh, my God. It's all made up. Now, now the Biden one, I'm going to give him a pass because it is true that in many of the polls, Biden is leading. However, I will say this. When you look at the methodology of those polls, they oversample older voters. They're using landlines, and they oversample older voters. Now, for the Democrats, especially in a Democratic primary, who's going to really make the decision? It's going to be younger voters. As long as, as long as younger voters turn out, they will be the ones making the decision. So to, to over-focus on polls that were done on landlines that oversample older voters, that's a terrible mistake. And also, you have to remember, Joe Biden ran for president about 37 times already and always got his ass handed to him. So he's a little bit like Hillary Clinton in this sense. The more he's out there in public, the more people dislike him. So when he campaigns, the polls go in the other direction. They go down because your Uncle Joe always does his gaffes. So you have to remember that. That's important, that the more he's out there, the more he tanks. Same thing happened to Hillary. Hillary, gigantic lead. And then the more she was out there, the more she tanked. And the more Bernie was out there, the more his polls went up. So these are all dynamics that are super important. And by the way, what I just said, that's some data journalism for you because that's factually accurate. <laughs> uh, Joe Biden was a leader oftentimes 
in these Democratic primaries at the beginning, and then he would fucking tank and go, he ran in 2008, and when Obama picked him to be vice president, he ran against Obama and got his ass fucking handed to him. The idea that Uncle Joe now all of a sudden, it was like, oh, we're ready for Uncle Joe. Every time he ran, he got d destroyed. So, and it wasn't like with Bernie where he surged and charged and almost closed an, closed an impossible gap. No, Biden starts high and then tanks. But I'm still going to give her a pass. Why? Because at least she's citing some of the data. Like, he, at least Biden's leading in some of the polls and she can go, oh, he's up in a poll. I'm going to pick him. So that's the least dumb of all the fucking, uh, you know, answers that were given there. Now, we get to the two funniest ones. Well, you know, I'm going to pick Beto O'Rourke. And uh, I have to say, this is not based on policy. You don't say, bitch. You don't say. In fact, David Sirota just today released an article. He did a superb and detailed and nuanced deep dive into Beto O'Rourke's voting record. And it is worse than any of us thought. He uh, voted with the GOP to go after the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau. He uh, voted with the GOP on some immigration issues. Uh, obviously, there were the votes that we bring up all the time, voted to fast-track TPP, voted to do uh, Wall Street deregulation, has not signed on to the Medicare for All bills. So, it, honestly, the record's even worse than I thought. So for him to say, this is a preemptive, oh, this isn't about policy. In other words, okay, yeah, we know the record's not that great. But yeah, um, okay, sure. So uh, I think Beto. Why? His mm, je ne sais quoi. Yes. So you just like him. You like him because you like him. You like him because of the energy, because of all the bullshit, um, nonsense reasons, like, the way he talks is great. Oh, God. The left, we're supposed to be smart on the left. We're not supposed to be the, like, dogs, where we're like, <gasps> whose personality do I like? <laughs> That's who I'm gonna pick. <laughs> ah, it's so sad. And then finally, the worst pick in human history. Amy Klobuchar. Listen, my, you guys, my audience, most of you are political junkies. Like, you, you really know your stuff. That's why when I fuck up on something, you're like, hey, here, you, you messed this up. This is, the, this is what you meant. This is what you said. So, you guys know your stuff. I'm guessing that about 50% of you don't even know who Amy Klobuchar is. That's my guess. Maybe more. Maybe 60 or 70% of you don't know who Amy Klobuchar is. You want to know why? She's non-existent. She doesn't exist. She's fake. She's made up. She said a grand total of like four words. She's like the Clarence Thomas of the Senate. Is she even in the Senate? I think she's in the Senate. See, I don't even fucking know. I follow this stuff for a living. I'm pretty sure she's in the Senate and not the House. But that's the point. She's the Clarence Thomas. She doesn't say anything. And what I do know about her is moderate voting record. So at a time with a rise in anti-corruption, anti-establishment, populism, at a time where this is just surging on both sides of the aisle. They're like, I got it. Let's go with the least populist, most pro-establishment, boring person. Amy Klobuchar is a pick from 1984. I mean, she is old school. She's worse than Joaquin Castro. Remember we covered him? Joaquin, Joaquin, uh, no, Julian, Julian Castro. Um, Joaquin Castro. Is that the other brother or is that the actor? Whatever. Um, uh, Julian Castro. He's from 1994. She's from 1984. She's, um, I'm very polite and I will say nice things to people and we should all get along and isn't America good? Vote for me. Picking Amy Klobuchar is the most embarrassingly wrong pick I've ever seen. You know what she'll be? She will be... She'll be... 2020s, if she runs. 2020s... Jim Webb. Or Lincoln Chafee. That's who she'll be. Or Bobby Jindal on the Republican side. That's who she'll be. Or Lindsey Graham on the Republican side. Scott Walker. She'll be any of those, like... People who, as I said their names right now, most of you were like, wait, those people ran in 2016? That's what she'll be. That's what she'll be. So um, get ready for her to get absolutely obliterated and for this person who just made that pick to somehow get a, a, a raise at the data journalism, non-data journalism outlet.